Hello all, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm really excited to be here, we both are. Uh, so today we are just going to share our personal journey of um, you know, testing in production and then leading it leading to uh, you know, API testing without writing uh, any test cases or data mocks, uh, which is a really, really painful task earlier. So I'll just uh, introduce ourselves a bit. Uh, we are both maintainers of Kefloy. Uh, we've been into open source contributions uh, from, we started from GSOC, GCI, uh, outreach -y kind of programs, uh, first as students and then mentors. Uh, you know, really loved the ecosystem. Uh, and previously we've led, um, you know, data engineering and office of CTO teams um, at Indian startups, Parai and Lenskart. These are logistics and uh, e-commerce SaaS companies from India. And so there, our role had a very key challenge that was strict timelines. So we needed to experiment with multiple things. Uh, in, you, you can say that you know, we needed to uh, build and launch within two weeks. And um, every day we were iterating through, through, through code um, and releasing. So the problems were, uh, due to the strict timelines, we had you know, very limited time to test. We did uh, maybe a you know, couple of happy developer flows, um, and that obviously <laughs> led to uh, regressions. You might have figured out yet. So uh, you know, to fix those regressions, uh, again, it uh, changed the deliverables that we had, uh, and testing was not uh, done enough. So, all we needed to reduce the bugs was just three things. One, that we needed to do the functional testing because it was experimental, non-functional was not really important. And uh, we needed to, uh, a, a tooling that could create the test cases and update the test cases so easily that we don't really have to spend time on it. And we needed something that could automatically you know, orchestrate the testing infrastructure. So that's all we needed, nothing much. Uh, so, you know, we explored a couple of solutions, tried some solutions. Uh, I'm just going to walk through all of the solutions and the limitations that we faced, and then later on, you know, showcase with what we ended up doing and a demo of that. Um, as usual, we started with writing the automation test suites that everybody does. Uh, and there were challenges with it that you had to write the test cases, all the automation test scripts. Uh, those are very brittle because we are you know, uh, changing the application code base so fast that the previous test cases needed to be maintained. Uh, and that led the frustration that I'm spending more than two times of the, uh, of the developer time just in testing or maintaining those test cases. Uh, also, it also had the problem of writing the synthetic data mocks, uh, which were not really close to real world scenarios. Uh, and people had shared test environments in our team. So uh, if somebody changed anything in the te test environment, maybe a database uh, or a configuration, something. So uh, the rest of the team's test automation suite starts breaking. Right. So uh, again, that was a brittle approach uh, that could not work. And then somebody told us, uh, hey, why don't you test in production? And <laughs> we were like this, right? uh, hey, dude, come on, you're cra crazy. Uh, why would you do that? So uh, later on, when we researched more about it, and it made more sense that your application actually is going to be deployed and you know, released in production. Uh, and ideally, you want all your test environments to be you know, just like production or the best effort uh, environments that you create like production. So if you can test in production without having any side effects, that's the best case scenario for your application. So we explored some ideas. Uh, Let's take an example, the shadow testing. Uh, so 
This is an application serving the user traffic. And uh, you have a new application version, let's say, application V2. Uh, and you try to mirror the traffic. And in the shadow testing, you compare the responses of your currently deployed and the new application version. Um, and you compare if it, everything is you know, matching, working fine, is compatible. Uh, that sounds like a you know, good approach, easy one. But it is good only for the stateless applications, uh, you know, like uh, maybe audio streaming or something like that. Uh, not really for the stateful applications. Uh, we had a stateful application, so couldn't take this approach. Uh, so, you know, in stateful applications, your, your application is basically talking to multiple dependencies. Um, you know, Twilio, Stripe, multiple dependencies. Especially in microservice um, architecture, there are internal calls and external calls uh, that your application uh, makes. So we're curious that uh, with application V2, what do we connect as a dependency? Uh, cannot directly you know, uh, uh, make it talk to the production dependencies. But then we figure out that some companies are actually doing that. They're connecting the application V2 to the production database. But the catch was that uh, they're aware and they guarantee that their application works in an idempotent manner. So it supports idempotency. It means that you know, uh, if you're doing one operation multiple times, uh, then your application behavior do, do not change for the same one. Um, and, and it responds with the same initial behavior. So, um, I mean, this was okay with that, but our, our application was not uh, idempotent. Uh, we could not guarantee that. We knew that there are going to be side effects. So, we moved on to introducing a proxy between it uh, that filters the read APIs. So, let's say if there is a uh, you know, read get API or any read API, uh, that would go to the production database. You can compare the responses easily, and you know, you can test those, but you cannot test write. So this was the limitation with this approach, um, that we could not test the write APIs uh, or the mutations. So you know, the next approach was that, how about introducing a replica of the data production database that we are, uh, that, that, that the stable application is talking to. Um, and this also sounded like a very good approach initially, but when we implemented this, the real challenges came in. Um, so the problem was that, uh, one, it was a huge uh, operational effort to set up this pipeline, whole pipeline. Uh, more than that, it was expensive to set up the complete replica uh, of the database. And even more than that, there was a replication lag. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, let's say you have a write API going through um, your application v1. It writes to the database. And uh, but while your database is syncing it up with the replica, uh, the same API call is being replayed for, via V2. So, you know, uh, there are multiple cases that might happen. Either the, um, you know, the happy case is the, uh, the test would go, go through because uh, the, uh, you know, replica did not sync, but if it sync, uh, because the replica sync, if it did not sync in time, uh, could result into database corruption, again, would give, uh, you know, wrong test results. So uh, this also did not work really well in uh, the right calls or the mutations. So uh, you know, uh, we were like, how about testing it later in time? Uh, why do we need to really do it in real time, mirroring the traffic? So uh, what we did was uh, we recorded the traffic from production, and we replayed it in a non-prod environment. Uh, instead of creating a replica that keeps in sync, we created a snapshot database. Uh, you know, 
in, in a non-fraud environment. And we replayed the uh, traffic. So first we captured the tra user traffic from production, then we replayed uh, after setting up the shadow database or the snapshot database. Um, so this also was a huge operational effort uh, because you uh, first try to record, then you uh, set up those snapshot DVs, which are expensive, uh, and then you need to update these snapshots timely. So these were also brittle. Uh, and then you need to write to compare the responses. So it was a very sound approach, but was expensive and, uh, you know, included a lot of effort. Uh, then, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just summarize until now. Uh, so the upsides of record replay and shadow testing that we talked about are, it is a low code approach, don't really have to write the test cases. Uh, we can easily achieve high coverage with it because you're capturing the user traffic. So there are multiple flows that you are capturing and will be able to replay, uh, which increases the coverage of the code base that your um, application or, or your API test cases are going through. And uh, there are sometimes uh, unexpected user flows uh, that you discover just via uh, you know, the real user traffic uh, that the developer did never uh, code for, but they discovered it uh, from the real world. Uh, the downsides are, uh, one, I think you might have figured out, the dependency states are hard to manage. Uh, and this approach is good for load testing or stress testing, but not really good for functional testing, I would say, because if uh, some of the APIs fail, there are multiple uh, user traffic calls that fail, and you have to go to each of the, sorry, each of the call and debug it. So that takes a lot of effort, time to debug, and causes a lot of frustration. So that's practically, uh, you know, very time taking. Uh, and of course, handling rights is always tricky in these cases. So we were here. Um, we were doing the record replay via uh, a snapshot DB from a product environment to a non-prod environment. Uh, and we thought, uh, how about if you're capturing and replaying the API request and response, how about we also do the same for the database queries? So by that I mean we create a virtual database um, which is just the database query request and response and not the complete database. Uh, we would deep dive a little bit into this. Uh, yeah, uh, but I would say that with this approach as well, there are some downsides like, uh, you know, you have to add support for each of the dependency that your application is talking to. Uh, for example, uh, you know, if your application is talking to MongoDB, then you need to add support to mock the MongoDB queries or to capture and replay that. So uh, there are different approaches that we are going to talk about SDK level or the agent level or the, at the network proxy. Uh, uh, and and uh, this becomes brittle in case your API schema completely changes and you have to re-record the user traffic and replay it. So these were the downsides, but, but the upsides were uh, better because uh, you know the, the complete database uh, did not need to be replicated to some other environment or uh, uh, you know uh, or neither it was expensive because we were storing just the query data uh, yeah uh, I would just pass it to Shubham to take it forward from here yep thank you Neo so um, essentially what we just discussed is we are going to virtualize the dependencies, or basically virtualize the infrastructure around the application. Um, to give an example, so let's say we have an application, uh, you know, it returns what sports a particular user plays, right? So the user is Thompson, and we have cricket, volleyball, carom, and boxing. Uh, so in this case, we have the application talking to MongoDB, which has all of the relevant data. Typically, if I'm going to, let's say, record replay, if I'm, you know, um, into a different environment, uh, I would 
you know, capture the request, run it again in my test environment, and this time, um, you know, maybe user Thompson isn't there, right? I mean, it's not the same state, or maybe user Thompson, uh, you know, likes different sports. So um, the problem that we're solving here is how do we ensure that, you know, the, the exact state is consistent with, our, uh, with, the, with the test case that we captured? So same example, you know, uh, if we, once we do dependency mocking, we can, instead of uh, maintaining a test database, we instead uh, kind of maintain a mock. So when we're capturing the get games request, we capture the uh, queries and the response that we got from MongoDB, and just uh, package it along with the, with the test case. So now when the same thing happens in our, uh, you know, while we're testing, we can just return the same response that we got for that particular request. So um, it's mocking, but we're actually re kind of replaying that exact database response that we captured. Um, yeah, and yeah, and, and, and then you know, things will be consistent. So now once we are here, uh, the next obvious problem to solve was, uh, should we build an SDK for this, or should we build an agent? By agent, what I kind of mean is something like a proxy. So um, imagine you know, it could be an on-wide filter, or it could be a network proxy, which you know, we could install. Um, on something like a Kubernetes cluster. So we went through you know, pros and cons of both. Uh, with an SDK, it's you know, easy to map requests to dependencies. So I think Nia touched a bit on this. Um, when you have, uh, maybe we capture a million requests, or maybe you know, 10,000 requests, and we're going to replay that. Uh, when there is a legit failure, uh, that particular API, I mean, there's probably 1,000 occurrences of that same particular API endpoint or function endpoint. So, uh, you know, m many of them would fail. We see that while we debug production applications as well. And um, I mean, when we're making a legit change, which is not a bug, it's very hard to go and update each one of them. So uh, it's easier to map request to the actual dependency calls within in an SDK because we are in the application runtime. We know what's going on. Uh, but at the network layer, it becomes very difficult because uh, all of this now work being done, uh, you know, in the in the open telemetry SDKs to add metadata to SQL queries and stuff. But you know, it's not a universal standard yet, so it's hard to really map out which database queries or which API calls exactly belong to which traffic. With the API calls, it's far easier if you use open telemetry already, but not with let's say if, if you use the Redis protocol or the MySQL protocol. So there's no guarantees there. Um, yeah, code level integration, ID integ integration become easier because if you're integrating, let's say, with a, with a, with a testing library. Um, everything that a testing library supports would automatically be supported. And definitely you get access to the application context and runtime, which can help us debug the application better, understand what's going on inside the application. But yeah, now agent has some significant upsides as well. Uh, you don't have to make code changes because it's running at the network layer. Whereas with the SDK, we'd have to write, uh, I mean, at least there would be some steps involved into you know, integrating the SDK into the code base. It's faster to deploy and adopt, you know, because again, less, less things to change, less things to break. And low development overhead for the developers of the agent or SDK. So like for us, um, I mean, with an SDK, I, I would have to write the SDK for different languages, for different frameworks. Um, whereas with the agent, it will be network layer, so it's independent of the language. And we would basically end up implementing different protocols, you know, MySQL protocol, HTTP. Yeah, so uh, now this is kind of what we ended up going with the SDK approach for now. Uh, although we are also working on an agent, I'll kind of show, show that in the, in the future scope. Um, but with the agent, so, sorry, with, with the SDK, essentially what happens is uh, in production, or anywhere, in fact, um, in fact, many of our users, they are using uh, the SDK locally, like on their on their laptops while while developing, to kind of capture the, the capture the request that they're making locally, and along with all that all the dependency calls, which can be you know used as test cases. Um, so the idea is simple: you integrate the SDK into your code, uh, you perform a bunch of requests. It could be local on your laptop or in your production environment. They get recorded, um, and they are bundled along with those dependency calls. So you can replay them anytime, easily. Um, and yeah, it, it can be done again, again locally or as part of a CI pipeline. Um, yeah. Perfect, so now I'll quickly show you a demo of what we ended up building. Uh, 
so Keploy, you know, it's open source. Um, to get started, in fact, by the way, um, we use Keploy to test Keploy. So um, since, like, we, we started with the Go SDK, so, and Keploy is also written in Go, so we, uh, we added support for Go test. So what essentially happens is, like, if you, if you look at the, uh, so we use GitHub Actions, you know, uh, since it's available on GitHub, um, we es essentially just run the Go test command. Right, and Keploy runs automatically as part of the Go, Go testing suite. And all of that coverage gets uploaded to the uh, you know, code coverage tool, and um, essentially, uh, that gives us the code coverage. Same thing would work, let's say, in, a, in an ID. So we don't have to create any new integrations. So uh, to get started, uh, like we have quick starts and examples, but um, you could either use a Docker Compose to do it locally, or there's a Kubernetes Helm chart. So I'll be using the Docker Compose to quickly show uh, an, an example. So uh, this is the Kepler dashboard, so it's very simple right now. It, it just has test cases and test runs. Uh, test cases here you see the application, for example demo 3 is an application right now, and these are some, you know, some requests which were captured. Uh, for this particular demo, I would be using, uh, so we have a URL shorter application to demonstrate how this works. Uh, it's also available uh, in the Keploy repo, uh, in, the, in, in the Keploy group, uh, in the Go samples. Uh, so it's a, it's a simple application. Um, it does three basic things, so I'll show that. And this uses a Postgres database. It has only one dependency, which is a Postgres database. I'll also run that locally using Docker Compose. Yeah, so we have the Postgres up and running. Now we can you know, start the application. So you know, we're using the Echo framework for the sample. And to now run a bunch of requests. So to start with, I mean, it's a simple post request. Uh, we can send in any URL in order to return the shortened URL. Uh, in this case, yeah, it returned the shortened URL along with the timestamp. So timestamp is important because, um, you know, there are any anything time sensitive will change. So these these causes flakiness and you know false positives. So Kepler also handles that, uh, which I'll show in a minute. And once I've done this, then um, I can get this. Okay, so it's already pasted on top. So this redirects to GitHub.com. Then I can you know maybe change it to Bing. So I did that. And you know, just a delete call. So let's just delete that short in your all together. So I did a bunch of uh, requests. Now, if I go to the Keploy dashboard, I can see that here, um, you know, many of them were captured, right? Uh, it looks like the get did not get captured because it was cached by the browser itself. So one way to do that would be create it again. We can do a curl. Yeah, we can do curl. I think that should do it. Perfect, we, ha we have the get as well. So get is basically redirect. Um, now if I, if I actually go inside, right? So this is request, this is response, the standard things. Where it becomes interesting are the dependencies, right? So uh, it's able to capture, uh, so here what we're seeing is the metadata of all the SQL operations that happen. Uh, it would be same for other databases or you know, other dependencies. Um, what it's not showing right now are the binary data, you know, that's currently stored in the Kepler database, which will be used for basically virtualizing the infrastructure. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get to that. So here we have a Go test integration. So I'll stop the application. Uh, I can in fact stop the database because I don't need that during testing. And I can run the test with coverage. So what this is going to do this is going to download all the test cases that we just saw on the UI, run them one by one, and you know, give us some kind of uh, result around what happened. Uh, as we can see, it shows 74% coverage because of the integration with Go test. Uh, it's all, all of this calculation is done by Go test. And now if I go to test runs, I can see all those, all those five tests here. Um, I can see what, you know, what response I got back. Um, and you know, so, like I was talking about the, the, the timestamp, right? So as you can see, the timestamps are different. 
the way this works is it, it issues a second call and it compares them. So if, in fact, if you go to the raw events, you can see we add it as a noisy field. So body.ts, that's a timestamp field. Now, um, yeah, what happens if there is, you know, uh, a bug or, an, or a known regression or a, or a uh, real change? So for that, what we could do is maybe let's change one of the keys. So I'll change the URL to URLs um, and run the test again. So as we can see, a bunch of test cases failed. And if I go to the UI, um, I can see you know both the posts fail because I changed the key of you know uh, one of the parameters. Um, now, I mean, this could be a bug or it, or it it could be something that we want. So for that, so considering that this is a no, uh, this is an expected behavior, we can normalize it again just right from the UI here. And now the test case is updated. So if I run the test case again it would basically fetch the updated version of the uh, test case that, that we just normalized. Okay, so I just normalized one of it. So I have to normalize the other as well. This also bulk normalized, you know, just for this purpose. So I have to go here as well and normalize this as well. Perfect, now all of this should pass. Cool, yeah, so as you can see, uh, they all pass. So you can you can you, you can work normalize if you know you know it's 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 from the same cause. Um, so that's a quick demo of Keploy. Now coming back to the presentation. Yeah. So current state, right? We, uh, where are we right now? Um, so we added support for Go. Like we are more familiar with it. Uh, that's where our tech stack was. So we made the Go SDK first. Uh, we're currently adding experimental support for Java, uh, JavaScript and TypeScript. We have a UI to edit test and visualize test reports, which we, which we just saw, and we keep making changes based on feedback. Uh, we integrate with, we try to integrate as much as possible with native test tooling and open standards, so that you don't have to make changes to your pipelines or any of that. Um, we can easily detect and ignore noisy data, time-sensitive data, which we again saw, for example, timestamps, so those get automatically detected. Now the limitations, right? Every, everything has limitations. There's no tool which would work for all use cases. So uh, this, this does not test the impact of network or infrastructure failures. So as we can see, we are virtualizing the infrastructure. It would test functionality of the system under test. Now the system under test could be one application or it could be you know, all of your microservices, but uh, anything outside the system under test is not tested. So things like you know, impact of network failures or you know, maybe a, a dependency failing, those are not tested. So th those are basically out of scope. Um, to run this at scale, right? since it's an SDK and it's running inside your code, uh, we are implementing deduplication and sampling, but that is not tested in production yet. So that's something we have to try. Um, obviously, we'll iterate through it, but right now it's not. Um, Currently, yeah, I mean, we have language and framework specific SDKs, like I mentioned. Um, there we are trying to you know, explore how well they can use agent. Maybe we can use it for, um, you know, maybe not entirely for functional testing, but the other aspects of testing. Um, currently, like I said, the system under test, uh, the current version of Keploy supports the app one application, but we're extending that to multiple applications soon, but right, as of now, um, we support one application. So all of the applications can be tested individually, but if you want to test uh, maybe two, three applications together, that's something that's coming. So, I mean, if you uh, would like to try that and that's interesting, we'd love to, you know, uh, see you on the community channels. Data streaming is not implemented yet. So let's say if you're using gRPC streaming or WebSockets, we don't support that yet. So that's something again that uh, we're getting as user feedback. Um, sorry, yeah, so we don't support that yet. Future work, uh, yeah, contract testing. So essentially, if you, if, if you think about it, we're, um, we are kind of doing contract testing. Like we're, we're verifying if things are working fine, but uh, there, there, there are some aspects of contract testing, like, for example, integration with the clients, um, knowing if, you know, if, if the client did something wrong and not just breakage at the server level. So this is going to be server-driven testing, but 
we've been getting feedback that there's a lot that we can do on ensuring that the client side contracts are also working fine. So that's something we'll be extending and you know more on the to make it on par with the ex existing contract testing tooling. Um, recording from live environment, like I mentioned. So right now, uh, like form production environments uh, at scale, that's something that we need to work on. That that we're benchmarking. Uh, it works well for you know maybe beta environments or even locally. So that that's where we've been trying out so far. Uh, we'll be releasing the Java and TypeScript um, SDK soon. I, in fact, we have the experimental SDKs, but yeah, these stable releases are coming. We'll have an agent implementation, and yeah, um, we're trying to borrow, you know, things like, uh, I mean, implement things like first testing or, uh, you know, use context from the test cases that we have to generate additional test cases, which can add more coverage uh, to the to the existing tests. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, that's basically um, what. We, we, what we wanted to cover. Uh, we are available on GitHub. Uh, you know, please check it out. And we also have a Slack channel. Uh, we, are, we are a young, growing community. So I would love to have, um, I mean, would love to have all of you and uh, you know, discuss your use cases and uh, you know, solve new problems. Yep. Uh, I think now we are open for questions. If Correct, correct, that's right. So as of now, it's very uh, rudimentary because you know we just capture that and, and, and replay like you said. So before that, I'll just repeat the question. So I think the, uh, the question is that how do we protect data, right? Because we are capturing requests, we're capturing responses, we're also capturing database queries, and we're replicating it. So everybody who has access to the platform has access to all of the data. Um, that's a great question, and um, we are planning to add, I mean, that's a, that's a feedback that we've been getting that you know, to an ability to re redact the data so that users on the platform don't access sensitive data. And also, I mean, since it's open source and you can host it yourself, um, you know, provide ability to encrypt the data, you know, in case somebody has access to those machines where, where it's stored. Um, so right now, yeah, right now it's not supported, right now it's very simple. So for that, that's a feature that will be added to ensure that, you, can, you know, that sensitive data is not um, directly applicable users or have some access control layers based on how the organizations want to do it. Yep. What about like you need to test a workflow to you know these are individual like request responses, but what about like I want to add and then update and delete and you know carry the state through that? Um, is there a time for something like that or where that fits in? Yeah, yeah. So um, from the feedback that so okay first I'll repeat the question again. So I, I think your question is that, um, how about creating test suites? So right now it looks like these are individual test, uh, test cases. Can we bundle them together? Maybe uh, it could be part of a, part of a PR or, or, or part of a particular uh, you know, use case and have those separate as test suites. Uh, yes, I mean, seeing uh, how most QA work workflows are done today, I think that's, uh, that's a very critical requirement. And um, yeah, we are, we are working on that. So you, you'll be able to, you know, create named test suites, and all of that context would be within that particular named test suite. So they can, and, but those test suites would be independent because they would have their own virtual infrastructure, so they can run in parallel, they will not depend on each other, but within that test suite, uh, you can have an option to keep them dependent. Perfect. Any other question? Do uh, we have any virtual questions? From the live stream, we don't have. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, I think that's it then. I mean, it was really cool, uh, you know, uh, presenting Keploy and uh, you know talking about a journey. Uh, please feel free to re uh, reach reach to us anytime and you know discuss any problems or use cases that you have. And uh, and yeah, if you if you try and face any problems, please join our community channels to you know. Um, Discuss them. Yeah. What is your community here? Are those on a specific day? Is it learned? So, uh, 
currently we host monthly uh, community meeting and rest um, all our you know all the queries and discussions are done on slack if somebody has a specific use case uh, we just share a zoom or a meet link and we get them on the call and discuss what what is the use case and if we can add it in the roadmap Yes, monthly uh, on 25th of every Friday. Yeah. Yeah, and you know you can feel free to uh, you know chime in on the Slack channel and ask any questions. So we're we're always there. Awesome, perfect. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much.